Hello to everyone. It's great to be back with you. It's my uh, third time presenting uh, in these COVID days. And uh, I'm speaking to you from Ottawa. Bill was speaking to you from Vancouver Island, about 4,700 kilometers away. And David, I guess you're probably about 5,000 kilometers away from me. And, and isn't that astonishing to think that we're all here today and all talking? Um, my, my presentation um, today and tonight for you is uh, based on new research that informed a major exhibition at the Canadian War Museum that I curated with uh, Jack Granistein, Canada's greatest um, military historian, and then explored the Canadian Corps and the 100 Days campaign. That campaign, as I think you know, is really a series of battles from MEN on the 8th of August, 1918, uh, which saw the Canadian spearhead uh, battle after battle until the capture of Mons on the last day of the war, November 11th, um, 1918, last day of the war, at least on the Western Front. But I'm not going to talk about those battles, and instead I want to push the argument and the historiography a little bit today by talking about the liberation of the French, and to a lesser extent, Belgian civilians during this time period. So I, I plan to make three points in this talk, and, and like Bill, I'll try to keep it to half an hour. They're all connected to the idea of Canada's war of liberation. The first point is that some Canadians enlisted because they saw this, the Great War, as a war of liberation. That's, that's a fairly new thing, and I'm going to build on that, but I'd like you to keep that in mind. Secondly, that there was this critical liberation period during the 100, years, 100 Days campaign, especially after the Canadians captured Cambrai on the 9th of October 1918. I'm going to tell you more about this, but the Canadians liberated over 200 cities, towns, and villages, giving back freedom to over 70,000 civilians. Now, that in itself is quite astonishing, but it is almost never discussed in books and in articles because, for the most part, the focus is on the Canadian victories in the Hundred Days and those victories that came at such a terrible cost in lives. About 45,000 Canadians killed and wounded in those Hundred Days of battle. So I'd like to just tweak this a little bit and we can talk a bit about this liberation. And finally, I'd like to wrap up and talk a little bit about why the memory of this liberation has faded over time and why I think it, that's had an impact on uh, how we talk about the war. Now, uh, as a British dominion in the empire, Canada was at war when Britain went to war on the 4th of August, 1914. But it was Canadians who would decide the extent of their commitment. Now, standing by Britain was the primary factor in drawing Canadians into the ranks. But there were other impulses too, not the least being the outrage over Germany's invasion and occupation of Belgium and France. Stories of hardship and atrocity were amplified by propaganda, but there was a core truth that Germany was by late 1914, occupying one-fifth of Belgium and about 5% of France, including 2 million people in the northern and northeastern section. Under such conditions, with Germany as a great power smashing its neighbours and occupying the land of Western allies, it's not surprising, I would suggest to you, that the Canadians were motivated to action because of that occupation. Now, I'm maybe belaboring the point a little bit here, but as we know, since the 1960s, and perhaps stretching as far back as the early 1930s, there's been a really strong sense that in the literature, in novels, in plays, um, in films, in many history books written up to the 1960s, that the soldiers were tricked into serving, or that they were naive and did not understand the full ramifications of their actions when they enlisted. Now, again, a qualifier, I'm a historian, we're always qualifying. There can be no doubt that few Canadians or any other soldiers, I would suggest, anticipated the trench warfare experience on the Western Front with all of its brutality and carnage. And yet many Canadians were motivated to serve because they felt it was a just war. And that's something I'll just explore for the next couple minutes. 
As Canadian politicians and other societal leaders stoked the fire of patriotism, they almost always pointed to the German occupation of Belgium and also of France. This is in the speeches, it's in newspaper accounts and editorials, it's, it's everywhere. You simply cannot miss it. Um, both the British and the Canadian people talked of standing up for little Belgium with the Kaiser's uh, contemptuous phrase that the treaty signed in 1839 guarantee, guaranteeing Belgian neutrality was but a scrap of paper. And you can see a propaganda uh, poster here highlighting that. The British people rebuked the Germans, spoke of honoring their commitments, and the Canadians felt the same. The invasion of Belgium and the subsequent atrocity stories, both real and fabricated, also motivated the Canadians to action. There was the burning of the Louvain Library with its 300,000 irreplaceable books and manuscripts, the execution of some 5,000 partisans and civilians, all real, which were mixed with more fabricated stories of bayoneting babies and the mass rape of women and girls. And, and uh, Louis Raymaker's cartoons seen here were very popular in Canada and in much of the, the Western world for highlighting the atrocities. They would fall under, I think, pure propaganda. And yet um, they motivated Canadians to action. There are many accounts of Canadians who spoke about the need for them to serve. I'll give you just a few. Uh, Private Dan McClellan from Grand River, Prince Edward Island. He wrote to his mum that he felt obliged to serve because of German oppression. He even wrote that he preferred not to go to war, but in his letter, when a peace-loving country is in distress and thousands of its peaceful, loving citizens driven from their homes by the unjust hand of Prussianism, could you ever forgive a son for being a traitor to those peace-loving people? Now, there were others like Dan who thought the same way. The fight to free the oppressed of Western Europe stirred many to action. It was the primary cause for some, but more, I think. It was just one of the many motivations on the overlapping mental map of emotions that impelled or compelled Canadian men to leave their families and communities to go overseas. So not simply one factor, but one of many. And I, and nonetheless, I think this has been downplayed. I'll, leave, I'll give the final word to a French-Canadian soldier, future Governor General of Canada, Georges Vanier, who recounted, I could not read the accounts of Belgian sufferings without a deep compassion and an active desire to right the anus wrong done. He felt compelled to serve, and he did. Now, I don't want to overplay my hand here. The idea of freeing the oppressed motivated many, but again, there was this constellation of ideas of patriotism, adventurism, uh, financial reasons, issues of masculinity. These have all been explored by uh, historians. And yet, I think many of those motivations were blown the Canadians were in the trenches. And I think it's the same for, for many nations. And, and you can still find evidence of soldiers writing home to their families that they were fighting or motivated to fight to free the oppressed of France or Belgium, but it appears a less dominant factor in the trenches than standing by one's uh, mates in battle or simply seeing the job through to the end. But again, I think it's important to note that these were not a group of naive men tricked by politicians and propaganda. Many Canadians, and I think this extends to others in the British Empire, served in this war because they believed it was just and necessary because, and I want to emphasize that, because of the occupation of France and Belgium. And I just draw your attention to this image on the screen. It's a, it's a terrific colorized image of Canadians, some of them obviously either going to the baseball pitch or coming from it. Uh, and as part of our exhibition, we had colorized a number of these um, historical photographs, I think, which kind of bring a vibrancy um, to, to these images. Now, in, in the remaining sort of 20 minutes or so, I want to jump ahead to the Hundred Days Battles. Um, these series of battles, as I mentioned, um, the Canadians fought uh, at Amiens, at Arras, the capture of Cambrai, and then fighting uh, 
to the liberation of Mons. They paid a terrible price for being that spearhead formation. And Bill gave you um, a great insight, I think, into some of the reasons why the Canadians were effective, but also why they were continuously thrown into battle. Um, but I'm going to pick up the story here after the capture of Cambrai. Cambrai, the key logistical city and a large sector on the Western Front, which the Canadians captured on the 9th of October, after almost two weeks of grinding warfare. Um, and, and this is really, a, this breaks the back of the Germans on this front, and they're in full retreat um, um, from this point on. And the Canadians, too, are... are um, bloodied and bruised. At this point, they've suffered about 42,500 casualties killed and wounded. Although really interestingly, I have a new book that I wrote over COVID on a medicine in the First World War, medicine in the Canadian Corps. And during this period, I'm giving you a little bit of a, a sneak peek here, the deaths to wounded ratio are far lower. On the Somme, they were as high as um, two, one death to two woundings. During the 100 days, it's about one death to four and a half woundings. And there's a, a bunch of reasons for this. One of the key ones being the evolution in medical care. And yet I think the larger point is that the Canadians are exhausted, they're fought out, and yet they continue to lead a first British army as they advance. And they push off moving in a, a northeastern direction from Cambrai from about the 14th of October. And this is really the great liberation phase. And you can see a map here, Cambrai is in the bottom left corner, even off the map. And you can see the pathway that leads to Mons. Um, it's about 75 kilometers and uh, two divisions, the first and second division fan out and advance along every road um, as they begin to chase the broken army in front of them. And this really begins around the 14th and the 15th of October. Um, the Canadians, it's worth remembering, um, didn't know that the war was going to end. We know when I say 14th and 15th of October, we know we can go ahead and mental math and go, oh yeah, 11th of November is coming pretty fast. Of course, the soldiers at the sharp end, they don't know that the war will end. Um, most of them, of course, thought the war would extend into 1919 and 1920, as did their generals. It was only in the victories of the Hundred Days, and, and especially after Cambrai, where you begin to see in many of the soldiers' letters and diaries saying, this war could end. The Germans seem beaten. The Hun is on the run. Um, all of those things. And yet this is a very tired Canadian Corps that is marching forward. Um, nonetheless, one of the quotes uh, from, from the time period comes from Corps Commander Sir Arthur Curry. You see him in this colorized image. He is uh, taking the salute. He wrote in an official report, the Germans were falling back everywhere. Now, the Germans were not in a full route. They, were, um, they left strong rearguard forces to slow the pursuers. They engaged in a scorched earth policy. They destroyed bridges. They created roads. They fouled water sources. Um, snipers and machine gun teams were left to, sacrifice, um, to be sacrificed, to, but to slow the Canadians. And yet every day the Canadians advanced um, five, six, seven kilometers, capturing uh, hundreds of German prisoners each day. From the morning of October 18th, um, the Canadians begin to encounter more heavily populated French towns. And on the 18th alone, they liberated 12 large settlements along with smaller villages. The next day on the 19th, the Canadians advanced 12 kilometers, the single largest advance during the course of the war. There were a steamroller advancing on a wide front and they liberated another 40 settlements. Many of these liberations involved uh, full out battles with the Germans, uh, digging them out of towns um, in the industrial town of Denain. Um, two German battalions were driven out by three uh, Canadian battalions, so not an overwhelming um, degree of strength there to attackers and defenders, and yet steadily the Germans were pushed back. The war diary uh, diarist for one Canadian battalion wrote on the 19th, coffee, cognac, kisses and hugs were showered on the troops by the populace who were frantic with joy after having suffered four years of slavery under the ruthless rule of Hun masters. The act of freeing the French during this period, and which would continue uh, until the end of the war, 
was verbalized by the citizens of Danaean and others who sang out in praise and posted banners that read, De vivre le Canadien, glory to the heroes, long live the liberators. There are accounts of the French and the Canadians singing to each other back and forth. Um, flags were waved, drinks uh, were were taken out of long storage by the French and served up to the Canadians. And as the Canadians continued to march eastward, the French poured into the streets. And I think what's really interesting here, the French seem to have waited two or three days as the lead Canadian units passed through their towns and villages, continuing to drive the Germans back. I think wondering if the Canadians would be thrown back in the typical seesaw fighting that had been so characteristic up to that point uh, over four, almost four years of war. Uh, but it didn't look like the Canadians would be driven back and the French began to come out in greater number. And, and a Canadian gunner from the 43rd Battery wrote of the period, it was probably the greatest moment of the war as we passed down the street, the women, old men and children yelling themselves hoarse and waving long hidden flags. The greatest moment indeed, that's worth reflecting on. Echoing that comment, the regimental historian of the 15th Battalion wrote of the combat hardened soldiers burnt by the sun, having buried so many of their comrades. And yet it was the first time they had ever really felt like heroes and saviors of democracy. As part of the experience of the cheering people waving flags that raised the Canadian soldier spirits, they also encountered thousands of refugees who began to return to their homes and communities. They had been driven out sometime over the last four years of the cruel occupation. And with the Canadians logistics stretched to the breaking point in the long march, there was the added strain of having to feed and offer medical care to the tens of thousands of French. Uh, a Canadian wrote, over 200 civilians are sick. He was, he was uh, trying to care for them in a field ambulance. About 15 of them have died in the last three days from consumption, starvation, and general ill treatment from the Hun. Now, uh, the Canadian doctors and orderlies and nurses of the Canadian Army Medical Corps, they were following the fighting units. Some, of course, embedded it with frontline units, but they began to immediately set up hospitals behind the lines, uh, dedicated dressing stations that focused almost solely on the civilian population that was suffering from all manner of ailments and disease brought on by the cruel occupation. And of course, there was also the Spanish flu, the killer mutated virus that was claiming uh, so many people uh, along the Western Front and in fact, soon to be around the world. It was especially effective in killing the malnourished and the sick. The Canadian diaries, both the official ones and private ones are filled with references to the flu and trying to care for sick civilians. And yet amid this suffering, there was joy. As one Canadian medical officer wrote of the final month of the war, one and all were looked upon as heroes and deliverers from oppression. He and other Canadians talked about their excitement in giving the French and the Belgians in the final days of the war back their freedom after four years of cruel occupation. Now, the liberation continued into the last week in October, and in fact, of course, continued all the way to the last day of the war. But there was a special celebration in Denain um, for the Canadians, and it was held on the 27th of October, 1918, um, and Curry was there, and a very special young staff officer who was temporarily attached to the Canadians. And if we were all in the same room, I'd ask you maybe to point him out. You can see Curry and standing in front of him, looking over his left shoulder is, yes, the Prince of Wales, the future King Edward VIII, who was attached to the Canadian Corps. And there's lovely accounts of the celebrations um, uh, and, and the enthusiasm and the wild cheering of the French citizens uh, for the Prince and also for the Canadian Corps Commander Curry. Now, from the 11th of October until the Canadians faced off against the Germans in the last set-piece battle at Valenciennes on the 1st of November, they freed at least 70, 
thousand French civilians in their relentless advance. That's a that's a staggering figure, I would uh, suggest. And they continued to liberate uh, into November as well. Now, for many of the Canadians, this was a capstone for why they had sacrificed so much, why they had paid such a terrible price in the previous battles for the Canadians from the the April 1915 Battle of Second Deep, the Battle of saint eloi the Battle of Montsorel in June of 16, the fighting on the Somme, Vimy in April, Hill 70 in August, Passchendaele in October, um, the defense against the March Offensive, and then the brutal battles of the Hundred Days. The Canadians had lost heavily. And yet this period, you can find it in letter after letter, Canadians saying it makes sense now. And I want to give word here, the last word, to a Canadian, Private William Davidson of the 72nd Battery, who upon taking part in the great liberation of Mont on the last day of the war, he said, it made one feel that all this fighting had been worthwhile to see a people so glad to be delivered from hard rulers. Now, more could be said on this liberation period, and I have said it in, in a small publication. Um, the Canadian Legion in Canada publishes, Legion magazine, they publish these small hardbound books, about 100 pages. This one just came out a few uh, weeks ago, and it's available online if, if this interests you and you'd like to find out more about it. Uh, but in my remaining time, I, I want to explore briefly how and why this liberation was forgotten. Because I, I think you'd agree with me that we don't think of the British or Canadian commitment to the fighting on the Western Front as one of liberation. So after the hard fought victory, the vast Canadian expeditionary force was demobilized and the citizen soldiers were returned home to their communities. And Canada moved forward into a new uh, uncertain future. And again, coming out of the exhibition and the conference, uh, Jack Granisey and I edited a book on this, which has recently come out. And if you're interested in the turmoil and the return of veterans in Canada in 1919, you, you may want to try to get a copy of this. It's published with UBC Press. Um, but I'm going to focus on why I think the liberation idea was forgotten and why it's not part of the social memory of Canadians. And I, and I would think as well uh, of the British as well. We must start, I think, with the fallen, the fallen soldiers. And for Canada, it was 66,000 uh, slain soldiers dur uh, during the war and in its immediate aftermath. And they, they haunted the nation. They stalked the imagination, I think, of Canadians. Uh, as we know, to mark this gutting wound, individuals, communities, cities, provinces, the national government observed, marked, and commemorated the loss. There was Armistice Day with its two minutes of silence, the poppy adopted from John McRae's poem in Flanders Fields, thousands of memorials erected in communities across the country. We built a provincial memorials. We built a national memorial unveiled in 1939 in downtown Ottawa. Uh, these were joined uh, by overseas memorials and many of you, I am certain, have visited them along the Western Front. There is at Ypres, the brooding soldier seen here on the right, uh, Beaumont Hamel, where the Newfoundlanders were cut down on the Somme, and most prominently at Vimy Ridge on the left with the twin pylons. The war had changed Canada. The country had stood shoulder to shoulder with Britain and other allies, and the long exertion forever transformed the nation. And to just take one example, Vimy took on greater importance after the erection of the memorial there in 1936, and the battle and the monument together became a symbol of Canada's coming of age. Historians, with the gift of hindsight and study, reflected on the war's importance. Donald Crichton, one of Canada's greatest historians from the mid-century, mid-20th century, was to write, in 1914, the nation resembled an overgrown, awkward adolescent who had not yet reached manhood. It was the war that completed the great transformation and demonstrated its reality for all to see. 
He was echoed by G.W.L. Nicholson, who wrote Canada's one-volume official history of the Canadian Expeditionary Force in 1962. And he wrote, as the war progressed, the sense of national unity which permeated the Canadian Corps became stronger and stronger. They fought as Canadians. And those who returned brought back with them a pride of nationhood that they had not known before. Now, those historians and others were not wrong although the war was often viewed differently in French-speaking Quebec, where despite tens of thousands serving, the idea of conscription imposed by the English majority was most prominent in the social memory of the war in the decades to follow. In fact, the First World War became weaponized as an event, a political event, especially in the 50s and 60s, as Quebec intellectuals were fighting for independence from Canada. I think for a comparison, you might think about how Ireland and Ireland's war service has been made and remade and contested over time. Now, as I mentioned, many of the politicians and intellectuals in Quebec chose to highlight conscription instead of service. Uh, And I recount this in, in my book on Vimy and how English Canadians turned to Vimy as a powerful symbol of unity, national development, and martial pride. I'll just make a quick note of the image here uh, of the unveiling at Vimy on July 1936. Some of you will recognize the figure whose back is to the camera unveiling Mother Canada. It is, of course, that same young staff officer from Denain, now King Edward VIII, who unveiled the memorial and soon after this relinquished his throne. Now, Talking about the memory of the war amid the many decades long heated debates about the war's meaning, Canada, as in most countries, there was uh, these discussions were shaded by contemporary commentators and politicians. And as part of this process, the idea of liberation was just pushed aside. It was neither linked to the concept of the sacred fallen, nor to the question of nationhood emerging as symbolized by Vimy and nor the war's darker legacy in Quebec. Those were the three dominant strands of memory that were entangled and entwined, contested over time, and yet they left little place for the concept of liberation. At the same time, the liberation idea was not marked with memorials. It was not an idea that led to intense debate about nation building or rendering of said nation. And it became even more foreign from the 1960s when there was a new generation of writers, historians, and filmmakers that condemned the war and the bunglers and the butchers who oversaw it. Obviously, the liberation idea was not found in discussions or diatribes of sending the boys into the maw of the waiting guns. There's also equally important, I would suggest, as this image suggests here, The next war, the Second World War, which was, as I have written, a necessary war, fought for freedom and liberation. And we see in this image the liberation of the Dutch. And this is a strong emotional symbol still in Canada, certainly more so than anything related to the Great War. If Canada's Great War led to Canada's coming of age or the emergence of a new nation or series of nations, The Second World War was that necessary war against Hitler and the fascists. And a few at the time or ever since have questioned the utter need to defeat the fascists with their mad dreams of conquest and genocide. Although, as I have argued in another book, we in Canada did a very poor job until recently in telling our history, in exploring Canada's important contribution during the Second World War. But that perhaps is a different talk. But the last year of the war, in 1945, when the Canadians engaged in the crucial work of saving the Dutch from mass starvation, from years of occupation, there are a lot of parallels there to what the Canadians were doing in the later phases of the 100 Days campaign. I won't push the point, but isn't it interesting how one event has been propelled forward, the Second World War, to help mark that war, while the other related to the Great War has been utterly buried. And of course, with the passage of 
the great war veterans, we who lost the war against time to join their many thousands of comrades who lay buried under Commonwealth War Graves Commission headstones overseas, that idea of a, a war of liberation, among many other things, that too, of course, was buried as those veterans passed away. I'm going to finish up with a few final thoughts. I want to make something very clear. Despite having spent 25 minutes arguing on the importance of liberation, it was not the sole reason why Canadians fought in the Great War. No. Canadians fought to stand by Britain or to serve Canada's emerging national interests, although it was never one motivating factor. And I would argue that the liberation idea mattered. And it matters if you read the letters and the diaries of the soldiers because they say it mattered. And it matters if you read the speeches from the politicians and from the pulpit and in the newspapers. Why? Because they say it matters. And I would argue that fairly, you know, up to now, it has almost been entirely ignored in the literature. During that final liberation phase, journalist J.F.B. Livesey, who was embedded overseas with the Canadian Corps and writing home to Canadians in newspaper accounts, he wrote of seeing a Canadian infantryman in the war's final days, taking delight in sharing his rations with stunted French children who had suffered severely almost all their lives under the German occupation. The war was imprinted on their tiny bodies through malnourishment and unimaginable psychological trauma. And yet these children cheered and laughed with the Canadian soldier who was far, far from his family. In that moment, the soldier turned to Livesey with tears in his eyes and said, for all we have gone through, our dead have not died in vain. Thank you. Tim, thanks very much indeed. That was a very enlightening and, and re really interesting presentation. So thanks very much indeed for that, ladies and gentlemen. If, if once again we can uh, raise our hands uh, as a silent but nevertheless heartfelt round of applause, that would be much appreciated. And Tim, I can confirm that there's stacks of hands uh, going up as, as a round of applause there. Uh, so, Bill, if you want to restart your video, um, I'm now going to go into the Q&A &Q session and invite um, some of the many people who have asked questions to, to come and join us. Whilst, whilst I'm doing this, I'll try and uh, uh, just summarise um, wh where we've had um, viewers from. Besides the obvious UK and Canada and USA, we have had viewers um, this evening from South Africa, Cyprus, Sweden, uh, which is fantastic, and also on a cruise ship in the Mediterranean. So, uh, so, so um, th thanks one and all for everybody uh, watching. Right, Paul, you're first. Paul, do you want to just unmute yourself? So, you yeah, uh, it's a question for Bill, if I if I may. Um, you mentioned um, conscripts in the CEF, and it came through quite clearly how. Uh, conscripts enabled Curry to implement his, his plans for the CEF. Do you happen to know what Curry's view was before uh, Robert Borden managed to secure conscription in Canada, please? So Curry was very much in favor of it. He was uh, very adamant that conscription was absolutely necessary. But what was puzzling was that he never made any public statement of that. So uh, his counterpart in England, Arthur, uh, pardon me, uh, Richard Turner, uh, wrote publicly in advocating for it. And I think one of the factors that uh, I think led to the later estrangement between Curry and the government was his lack of public support for uh, conscription. Curry was a liberal and uh, Borden was a conservative and Borden was pushing hard for conscription. And he was, I think, somewhat bitter about Curry's lack of public uh, endorsement of conscription. Privately, Curry was all for it. Pri publicly, he never mentioned it. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Can I can I add something to that too, just very briefly? And and Curry, um, you know, Curry suffers a, a tremendous blow to his reputation over the war, which I spoke to this group uh, maybe half a year ago, and um, 
uh, it's really fascinating that what Bill has brought out here on the conscripts and Pat Dennis and other yeah. um, Cur- Curry al- always had a real ambivalence to- towards the conscripts. As, as Bill has written in my edited book on 1919, Curry uh, blamed the conscripts for a lot of the riots in 1919. So um, while Curry may have had um, understood their importance, as I think he did, he, he also had an ambivalent feeling uh, towards them. It's quite a complex issue. Thanks for your question there. Thanks. Um, Rob, Rob Thompson. Good Hello, evening, Rob. Uh, Excellent stuff, Tim. Excellent stuff, Bill. Being a logistics and engineering freak, my uh, questions are going to be directed towards Bill. Not so much questions as points, really. Um, I think also to begin with, we, we talked about uh, uh, you talked about the resilience of, of the Canadian Corps because of the because uh, of conscription and the size of the battalions and the, you know the size of the corps itself. I think it's worth pointing out they also had the Fifth Canadian Division, which was being broken up in uh, in Britain at the time which provided them with a lot of uh, at least semi-trained men as well um more important those actually just just to jump in there briefly is uh by by the start of the 100 days all that manpower was used up those uh so there were 12 battalions in england like the engineers had already been stripped off the um artillery had been stripped off so it was just the infantry in fact the machine guns were also stripped off the problem was that these were these battalions had not been kept up to strength. So just daily losses had consumed all of that manpower before the start of the 100 days. Yeah. Um, on a far more important note to me is um, I'm going to talk, just mention one of the forgotten titans of the of the, the First World War, which is uh, General uh, Major General W.B. Lindsay, William Bethune Lindsay, who was, you know, I, I read his uh, report on operations at Passchendaele, which I always see as the genesis of the creation of, of uh, engineering brigades, which was so important that, that, that uh, Curry turned around and said, I would rather do, do without infantry if it meant I could have more engineers as well. And I think uh, I, 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 one of the things I'd like to know from both of you as Canadian historians is why is this man so forgotten in the historiography of, of the Canadian Corps and the First World War? I, I don't understand. I mean, he was the, 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 the effectively the creator of uh, Canada's unique tramways and uh, light railway system. And, you know, he was supported by Horn against uh, Geddes, uh, Director General of Transportation. Can you shed some light on why he's been so forgotten? Well, I think the a couple uh, aspects of it. One is he left no papers, so that's you know there's not much to, to grasp. But the engineering service and the CEF has not had much focus on it. There has been a handful of articles, but it's one of those everyone tends to focus on the infantry part of the corps when the engineers were an actual absolutely vital component to that. And it's you know I think when it's only when you really dig into the individual battles that you start seeing the importance of logistics and how that has an impact. Impact. And you're absolutely right. Lindsay was a key figure, and Curry really bought into what, what Lindsay was selling in being able to increase the size of that engineering force in the tramways. Tim might have some uh, perspectives as well. I think you're right, Bill. Uh, the the lack of understanding on the importance of logistics uh, is an indication of the part of the failure to study him. Curry always spoke very highly. Uh, when I was writing my book on Curry, going through his papers, n- always um, speaks so highly of Lindsay, and and you know even reversed himself. Uh, and when so when Lindsay, Lindsay was quiet, but but could be like a, a great engineer where he would sort of sniff, you know, someone would offer some suggestion, he'd sniff at it, and Curry would kind of look at him and, do you have an opinion? He go, well, that just won't work. You've got to do this, this, and this, and. Um, Curry certainly understood his value. And um, yeah, in a larger sense, I would suggest that probably Canadians um, have a fairly good understanding of some aspects, Vimy, maybe the Canadian Corps, maybe Curry, but almost no understanding of any of the senior officers. Uh, Bill wrote a biography of Sir Richard Turner, completely forgotten by Canadians. The divisional commanders, almost completely forgotten. I've given college, uh, I've given lectures at a staff college to senior Canadian forces officers who never heard of the divisional commanders. And so, um, you know, it, it's it's something we need to continue to work at. Uh, we, we historians who are still researching and writing, and I, I think sadly we're 
we're maybe getting fewer and fewer in number. Yeah, just a rejoinder to that. Is, is that I also find it interesting that uh, the uh, um, you know the the Canadian uh, engineering history really doesn't make much mention of him either. And if you look at the Royal Engineers, their their uh, their volume, um, again he barely figures into it. And I, I wonder, you know, just why that is. Is it not something more than just the general forgetting of, you know, the support services, as it were? I mean, which you find in UK as well. You know, um, any ideas on that? Why? Because, I mean, doesn't he end his days, really, in 1927, um, prospecting for, uh, uh, um, you know, the tar sands in Alberta? That speaks to maybe Bill's point, where so many of the Canadian Corps officers were militia officers or in the more technical services, railway engineers and stuff, they they had jobs for them. Of course, the great one of the great failures that Granitstein and I is clear in our 1919 book is this once great fighting force, the Canadian Corps, is absolutely gutted in 1919. It just dissolves and is gone. And uh, all of those lessons are gone with it. Okay, thank you. Well, and and Lindsay, Lindsay was, uh, I think, a permanent force officer, but very junior. He's either a lieutenant or captain in 1914. So his rise to the chief engineer at the Corps at the beginning of 1916 is absolutely meteoric. And but he is not, you know, he's not a like a typical engineer officer from the British side. So well, he's no. going to be oh, kind no. of dismissed from that, you know. Yeah, very from, much so. yeah. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, thanks, Rob. Thanks for your question. Peter, Peter Newnham. Yes, thank you. Um, question for Bill, if I may. Uh, Bill, you mentioned the the size of the Canadian divisions, um, 21,000, I think you said, as opposed to uh, average British uh, divisional size of 14,000. What did that mean in terms of the number of rifles uh, available to each? Well, the reality was that, so in theory, the Canadian division would have 3,000 more rifles. They have an extra battalion per uh, brigade, but with the addition of the hundred men and Canadian battalions, at least until well into the hundred days, are kept up to strength. In British divisions, battalions uh, like during Second Arras are cruising around five hundred men, and they put maybe four hundred into the line. Uh, you're, you're looking at maybe four to five thousand fewer rifles in a British division than in a Canadian division. Right. Quick supplemental, as is traditional. Um, I think Tim was the person who, who mentioned the number of casualties at the end of the, the 100 days. Did that mean for the Canadian Corps then that they were roughly operating at around 50% or were they able to be reinforced during that period? They were uh, They were reinforced. The challenge was is that the men that they were getting were not as well trained. They didn't have that open warfare training. And you can see that after, like during Amiens and Arras, the Canadians are operating at a very high level. But uh, like I think it was one battalion went through eight company, by the end of August, had lost eight company commanders, their entire intelligence uh, detachment or, or group. Uh, they had pretty much well lost all of their officers and gone through them twice. So by that point, you're working with very inexperienced officers with inexperienced NCOs. Yes, they've got the manpower, but they are not able to operate at the same level as they did in August. I think if to, just to add to that, what, has, what hasn't been explored in the literature to that level is the how do the Canadians continue to be a combat effective formation? If they lose 12,000 men at MEN and 13,000 at Arras three weeks later, so you lose 25,000 casualties of a Canadian Corps, roughly 100,000, uh, most of them to the infantry. How do you then have another battle three weeks later at the assault of the Canal du Nord and Cambrai, where we lose another 14,000 men in about two weeks of fighting? It's an astonishing uh, series of losses. And it is um, partially, I think, some of the factors that Bill has talked about, the systemic, the structural factors, the senior commanders, communications, but some of it too must be pure bloody mindedness in those surviving NCOs and officers who continue to lead when you collapse two companies down into one, or you have a, 
an, a, an NCO commanding four platoons. I mean, it, you read this in the war diary and it, it really is astonishing to think about um, those men at the sharp end and their ability to keep fighting in a, a tempo of battle, which is unimaginable, I think. Just as a further supplement to that, part of it too is the improvements in medical care and the German artillery, at least uh, the battle that I've studied most intensely, second Arras, plays a much smaller part in the battle. As a result, most of the wounds are caused by small arms fire, machine guns, rifles, etc. And so more of those troops are able to return maybe a couple weeks, three weeks, four weeks later. So you're still getting this infusion of uh, veteran uh, soldiers back into the uh, organization. But I think Tim's point about there is a very strong core inside the core that is able to absorb. And that's further to the point that I made about the importance of the engineer brigades, the infantry could focus on training. So they would often get three, four, five, six, maybe a week or more of intense training to get these new recruits to be able to plug into the system. Thanks both for your uh, answers there. Thanks, Peter, for your question. Chris John. Chris, do you want to unmute yourself there? Yeah, hi there. Thank you very much both. Very interesting talks. This one's principally for Tim. Tim, you talked about general support for the war uh, in Canada. We might think of a lot of Canadians uh, being British emigres, but presumably there was still a large French-Canadian population there. What was their attitude to the war? Presumably they would support it as... Uh, their French homeland was being invaded. Yeah, one would think, but that's not really the case. Um, the Canadian Corps is about 620,000, um, sorry, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, but half of that figure are British born. And there's a, there's a really rich, robust historiography trying to look at what does it mean to be British born? You know, a lot of these guys came over as farmers in 1911 and they're just going straight back. Others were, you know, came with their family when they were two years old and would be seen as Canadian. Of course, on top of that, a Canadian is a British subject anyways. There is no Canadian um, citizenship until 1947. So, you know, it's, it's a complex issue, but it, it's very clear that the Canadian Expeditionary Force and the Canadian Corps was an English fighting force it fought as part of the British formations. Its commanders were, for the most part, English. Um, but you're right. There is a sizable French-Canadian population in Canada, about a third of Canada. Canada is about 8 million people in 1914. About a third are French-Canadian. And they enlist in far um, lower ratios than, than English Canada. And why is that? Well, there's been pretty fierce debates over that over the last 100 years, everything ranging from... Um, the fact that it was a British army, English army fighting for Britain, the messaging was there in French communities, uh, often more uh, rural. Um, in wherever rural communities were in Canada, they often tended to have lower enlistment. There's a whole bunch of factors, but the one that you, you asked there is a good one. Did French Canadians feel a strong urge to help liberate France? And here the answer is not entirely clear, but there is some evidence to suggest, yes, that is the case. Georges Vanier wrote about that and a few others. The, the problem is that um, French Canadian letters have not survived to the same extent as English Canadian ones. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we, we have a bit of a challenge with the actual evidence. I think for some French Canadians, there was that pull and that urge. But the, the reality was is that um, in, in French Canada, in Quebec, the feeling was that France had abandoned Quebec in 1763. Now we're really going back here to the <laughs> Seven Years' War, uh, but they, they felt they had been abandoned, that they had carved out their own unique society. So there isn't that same pull. One thing I can say with certainty, there isn't the same pull as there is for large parts of English Canada to stand by Britain. Hmm. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Thanks, Chris, um, for your question. Campbell Garden. Campbell, do you want to unmute yourself there? Thanks for taking my question, David. Uh, this is a question for Tim. Tim, I'm wondering, is it possible that uh, the reason 
us Canadians don't remember or celebrate the, the liberation, uh, is that France doesn't want to remember it. You know, compared to the Dutch, I mean, the Dutch celebrate like crazy. They send us tulips. I'm not so sure the French send us anything. <laughs> It's it's a good observation, and you you may be right that there may be more there. I think in the 20s and the 30s, um, the French were quite willing to build memorials. They were quite willing to entertain British pilgrimages, Canadian pilgrimages. Um, but you're exactly right. In both world wars, the, the French um, have a challenging history to deal with, more so in the Second World War, and we know that de Gaulle, uh, you know, prickly is not even getting close to the right adjective to describe him and his relation to yep. the British and others. So you may be right there. I, I guess, as I wrote in my last book, The Fight for History, um, there's a good there's a good um, there's a good stream of writers in Canada who spend all their time bashing the British about everything. It's always the British fault. Sometimes it is. But, you know, in telling our story, it's got to be up to the Canadians. I mean, if the Canadian, if we don't tell our own story here mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the liberation, well, let's not expect the British or the Americans or the French to do it for us. So I think in this Fair case, um, I, I think that we failed to tell this story. And I think those other points um, are quite legitimate that I made. Right? The, the fall and we know how heavily the specter of the dead weigh upon the memory of the First World War, whichever country you live in. We also know that for certain countries, think of Australia and Canada, there is this emergence of a nation idea, which is true, even if it's been the hard parts have been sanded off. Um, but then there also is the opposition to the war, the butchers and bunglers and other aspects. So there's a lot of competing narrative strands here of which liberation doesn't really uh, reach up to those. And I wouldn't be arguing that it should. I hope though that my talk left you with a little bit of some thought to say, well, maybe there's another way to think about the First World War experience for the British, for the Scottish, for the Irish, for others as well. Because I do think this liberation idea has been downplayed across the Western world. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Robert, Robert Linnell, do you want to just unmute yourself there? Hello, Bill. Hello, Tim. Nice to see you again. I've got just one small thing to add, a little quote uh, from Curry about uh, liberation from his uh, diary on the uh, 20th of October. And he said, it is a most inspiring sight to go through all these towns and witness the joy of the inhabitants. All the houses are decorated with French flags. And the people seem overjoyed to greet the British soldiers. In many cases last night, they dug up wine they had buried for years to share it with the troops. Many of the men had a bed to sleep on again. But whether alone or not, I cannot say. <laughs> That's a great quote. Thanks for sharing it, Robert. Uh, you know, Curry was quite a Puritan. Uh, he had he had real trouble with the idea that soldiers might be cavorting around, even though he was a legendary swearer. But I think maybe the more important point there is that Curry was fully moved by this liberation idea. And it was important to him. He writes about it in his 1919 official report. It's important to him because of the casualties. The casualties were a tremendous specter. Um, and there were people in Canada who were gunning for Curry and said the losses were too heavy. What did it mean to capture MEN to, to Canadians in a farm in, in Saskatoon or Saskatchewan or someplace, right? What they knew were the deaths of their sons, and daughters and the wounding. So for Curry, it was really important for him to talk about the liberation because as he wrote, you know, what the Canadian Corps did was astonishing. And yet even Curry's words, he wrote about this, even they were eventually downplayed and diminished over time. And again, not really a part of our social memory when we talk about the war. Exactly. Thank you. It was a great talk from both of you guys. Thanks, Robert. Thanks very much. Sarah, do you want to unmute yourself there and uh, 
Yeah, thank you both for very interesting talks. And I actually a bit cheeky, and I've got a question, one for each of you. So if I may start with Bill, it's a really a quickie, really. Um, but what were the relations like between BEF and CEF on the ground? If we talk, if you're talking about how the Canadian forces have, have got have got their act together, really, for want of a better word, was there a sort of were they brothers in arms or did one consider themselves better than the other because of better organization or or what was it like for them amongst themselves together well i think you can look at it from a number of different dimensions so in one respect it's very different than the australians that there is not the contentious relationship that the australians have with the uh the, the palmies you know the palmy brits mm -hmm. um I'd say, you know, at an individual level, a soldier level, like a lot of the up to fairly close to the end of the war, half of those who served were born in Britain. So even though they may have come when they were two years old into Canada and consider themselves Canadians, there's still a very close connection to, to Britain. I would say that judging on some of the material that I've seen, like during the Second Battle of Arras, at the command level, there's a bit of a sniffiness the Canadians have is, oh, yes, the British, they failed again, you know, <laughs> or they, they don't know what they're doing type of thing. And certainly Curry could get pretty starchy when he was dealing with some of the British officers like Ferguson of the 17th Corps, whom he had no respect for whatsoever. Uh, but I think generally it was it was, you know, a, a positive relationship and certainly Curry to Horn. Um, you know, they, I think they respected each other, although I'm sure Horn got a little tired of Curry going over him all the time to Hague. Uh, you know, got a little sore from all the steps over his back on it by, by <laughs> Curry. Oh, thank you. Um, so my question to you, it's really been talked about a little bit, but uh, I'm interested to know about how the French speaking Canadians did was that did that have an impact back home when they're liberating French? Not the fighting so much, but the liberating. So they're, you know, French speaking, even if it is with a funny accent, you know, talking to Belgians and French or Wallon and, and France, is there a camaraderie with that more than maybe with the English speaking Canadians, or wasn't there that much of a divide between the two? divisions it's within. A, it's a good question, Sarah. Thank you. Yes. Um, there was one uh, all, all French uh, battalion. It was a 22nd battalion in the second division. And they're part of the liberation. And they have a quite different experience where, um, you know, they write about, oh my gosh, like the French are amazed because we're speaking to them in their tongue. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they have a they have a great relationship, and they talk about the drinking and the singing uh, in in you know the old French uh, songs and the new French Canadian songs. So there really is a strong relationship there. And um, what's interesting is um, you know those French Canadians who who come back to Canada in 1919. Well, they're, they're welcomed in um, French Canada, primarily in Montreal and Quebec City, the two biggest cities in, in the province of Quebec. Um, they're greeted as, as, as champions who come back. And there's huge parades and celebrations. And Serge Durflinger, a historian at the University of Ottawa, has written about this. It's really interesting. Um, and and the, the, the 22nd Battalion is almost held up as a symbol, like to the rest of Canada, saying, look at what our soldiers did. Now, they... They still enlisted in lower proportionate numbers, but yet there was a symbol there. The anger uh, to French from French Canada to English Canada was often at a higher level political elites, which was stoked over time. Now, there was undeniable anger, unrest, division during the war over conscription, primarily in the summer of 1917 and 1918. I don't want to leave the wrong impression here, but the, the, the way that history becomes politicized, the service becomes weaponized, becomes much later in the 50s and 60s when there's a second uh, or a very strong separatist movement in Quebec. So it's, it's a really complex idea, but I think your question is a good one. And it is, did, did the French Canadian soldiers have a different liberation experience? They seem to have, yeah. And they seem to have great fun. And English Canadians talked about finding the one French guy in the platoon 
uh, because French Canadians served <clears throat> all throughout the fighting use, who's invariably French, you know, nicknamed Frenchy or something, and getting him to translate and figure out where the Vin Blanc is and where <laughs> to get the beer and stuff. And yeah, so, um, but that too is a part of the story. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I've uh, got a question from Graham Evans, who unfortunately can't join us uh, for technical reasons. Uh, Gr Graham has asked the following. Uh, my grandfather ended the 100 days on the 11th of November 18 with the soldiers of the Canadian Corps at Mons, or so he told me. Given that Grandad was a Lewis gunner in the Middlesex Regiment, part of the 56th London Division, was this assertion true? Did the British and Canadian troops fight side by side at Mons? I suppose what Graham's saying here is, did the 56th Division um, join hands with, with, the, with the Canadian Corps at Mons? Uh, any, any, any ideas on that, chaps? I don't think so. Um, it was two battalions, the 42nd Battalion and the RCR's Royal Canadian Regiment that liberated Mons on uh, the early hours of November 11th. And the Canadian Corps had a fairly large sector of which Mons was in the center and the Canadians were advancing. And in fact, there were some Canadian units to the northeast of Mons, so they were past Mons. I think um, uh, what the story here is that Mons, of course, those of us who have been there, is a very large city. And it was at the time a place for billeting soldiers. And I don't doubt for one second that there were British soldiers there probably after November 11th, maybe even on the 11th, although I think it was only the Canadians that marched actually into Mons. Um, I guess, Bill, we'd have to see if, if it was, did you say the 56th Division? I don't think it was attached to the Canadian Corps. So it, I, more than likely he was there, but probably a few days after. And to soldiers, I think, and this is worth reflecting on, we, November 11th means a lot to us. We know that now. I'm not sure what it meant to the soldiers at the time. There was great celebration when the war ended on, at 11 o'clock. But many soldiers also believed that it might continue. And of course, it was just a temporary armistice. Uh, there was a very real up chance that the Germans could keep fighting. And so um, was November 11th seen as an extended pause for most soldiers? Were they uh, simply exhausted? I recounted in one of my books, two soldiers in a trench who refused to get out of it. And an officer is standing over them, looking down saying, you guys, we can get out now. We can get out now. The war's over. And one of them looks up at him and says, who won? <laughs> well, just to, I mean, further to that point is that as you went further from the front, the more likely there would be celebrations. There were raucous celebrations uh, in Canada at some of the or in, in, in England at some of the uh, camps or training camps that the Canadians occupied. In fact, one of them is treated as a riot. But as you get closer to the front, it's a far more muted response. It's more, OK, I guess it's over, but no one's, you know, not a lot are dancing at that point. Sure. Thank, thanks for that. Um, Peter's asked a, a question. This is probably possibly one for Bill, but not for either of you. Um, can, can you guys um, talk about the tanks uh, in the 100 days? Um, as that wasn't uh, particularly mentioned in, in, in Bill's talk, I, either of you, throw it, throw it open to either of you. Okay, so uh, the Canadians had uh, support of, I think, four tank battalions at Amiens. And so the uh, tanks played a major role on the first day, but each day subsequently, the number of tanks diminished significantly. And at Arras, uh, for most of the battle, there was very little, like there were sometimes there was as few as nine tanks supporting the Canadian Corps attack. It was only on the last major day of the fighting on the 2nd of September, there were even 50 tanks that participated in the attack. So the tank corps was basically gutted after Amiens and there were only handfuls of tanks made available. In some cases, uh, a, a tank battalion would be assigned and it would have to pull training tanks. It'd have to get lend or borrow tanks from another unit to try and get as much as nine tanks to support an attack. So the role of the tanks diminished significantly as the battle went on because there just weren't that many of them left running. Thanks for that, Bill. Tim? If, if I was to add just one thing to that, I would say that um, 
the combined arms warfare of the Canadian Corps and the British by 1918 is the all arms battle where uh, artillery and infantry are absolutely crucial. But when you layer in armored warfare and air power and communications and logistics and machine gun units and motor um, motorized mortar units, it's a really well-rounded fighting force. And I think um, the tanks, while they were always made a, a tremendously positive impression on the Canadians, when you look at the official records, as I know Bill has, as I have, you begin to scratch your head and wonder where they really are after about the second day of MEN. And, and they're, they're broken down, they're, they're burned out, they're knocked out, or they're fighting on other fronts, I suppose. And just to extend that, I think we have to recognize just how fragile and limited were these uh, weapons. Uh, by Arras, the Canadians had given strict instructions. The tanks are never to be used without barrage support, without smoke or at in uh, fog or uh, at night. So you can only use them in the initial stages of an attack. If you're going to do a deep advance, you can't use the tanks in the later stages because the German anti-tank efforts have improved to such an extent, it's almost instant death. And at uh, Drocor Creant line, every tank that crossed beyond the first objective was knocked out by the Germans. So they had a very, they're very fragile. They're very powerful. Like it's a, you know, the, a heavyweight fighter with a glass jaw. So you in, used in the right situations, they can be a great benefit but you can't use them everywhere and at all times. David, can I add one more thought there? I know this is annoying, but I just want to add one more to what Bill said. I think the key role of the tanks um, in these battles is to draw fire away from the infantry. And you can see that in the German attack doctrine when they're using artillery in a direct fire role. Um, they're, they're focusing a lot on the tanks because they're very fearful. I think, Bill, you'd agree. But what is happening is that artillery isn't being directed against the Canadian infantry. And the Canadian infantry know to stay clear of those tanks whenever they can. That's grand. Thanks very much. Thanks for your question there, Peter. Um, right. Uh, I've got a, 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 a point coming here from Paul Cobb about the 56th Division question. Paul's pointed out that by the end of 10th of November, the division had been withdrawn for arrest, although the artillery was still in action up to the armistice at 11 a.m. on the 11th of November. The forward infantry on that date uh, was at Harveng, about eight miles south of uh, Mons. So we've answered we've answered the 56th Division question uh, pretty pretty efficiently. So thanks for that, Thank Paul. You. Um, another question, and I'm conscious that time's matching on, so we might have to close it down shortly. But we've got another question about French Canadians, uh, which seems to be a uh, coming uh, back quite, quite frequently. This may be for Tim. Um, so Richard Crowe, who hasn't got a video, asks, um, did the French Canadians see that fighting in the war was a possible lever for independence? Great question, uh, Richard. And not initially. Nobody is talking about that. But when conscription erupts in, in the summer of 1917, there is the spark of a sovereignty movement. And um, uh, to give you an example, in Montreal, the largest city in Canada at the time, and the largest city, obviously, in Quebec, there are, there are demonstrations every night of 15 to 20,000 people every single night protesting against conscription. Um, and that there is a bit of a spark, uh, a member of parliament offers, uh, in a kind of cheeky way in the House of Commons, a suggestion that if if English Canada is not happy with uh, Quebec, maybe Quebec should separate. He pulls that. It was more theater than substance. But the divisions from the First World War, those divisions, they, they linger to this day. And I think when we talk about the legacy of war, when we think about the First World War for Canada, you, you know, this is the war that propels Canada forward. Um, to a greater sense of its own identity, its own standing, great pride in standing shoulder to shoulder with Britain, the success of the Canadian Corps, the heroes like Curie or the Victoria Cross recipients or nursing sisters, home front, massive contributions, and yet there is a darker strain as well, as we know 
in all war efforts in Britain as in Ireland, Scotland and others. And I think that is a legacy of war that historians, um, you know, need to remind themselves of when they talk about, in this case, Canada, um, that it is it forever changes the country, not always for the good. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm going to make this the last question. Uh, the questions uh, coming from Bill, for, from Bill Twist uh, for, for Tim, and, and I'll just read this out. Um, I fully appreciate your comments read really the emergence of Canadian nationhood in the Great War. Why was it, though, that in 1940 and 41, particularly with the Air Forces, were thousands of Canadians volunteering for service with the RAF? in another European war at a time that the evidence of Nazi atrocities had at that stage remained yet to be revealed. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think the question is, why were Canadians, wh why did Canadians serve in the Second World War? And then why did Canadians serve with British units in the Second World War? I think that's the gist of it. Yeah. Canada um, was firmly committed during the Second World War. Um, Canada, uh, with the Statute of Westminster from 1931, would decide its own fate on the... And Canadians went to war, again, I would argue, to stand by Britain but also because they believed in the necessity of that war. They understood that. Uh, and, and that war, which was initially the, the government of the day, tried to have a limited war. And really, um, it was a massive Canadian contribution. 1.1 million Canadians in uniform fighting on all fronts and the home front. And I, I won't go into all the details there. Um, but that was firmly seen as Canada's contribution that Canada would stand by the Western allies. As a junior ally, we shouldn't claim too much for Canada, but as an important ally. Um, why did Canadians serve with British units? That's a great question. And, and it's, it's more complex. It's that we didn't have enough uh, RCAF, Royal Canadian Air Force squadrons at the start. We had the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, which trained up 131,000 airmen, um, Canadian, British, New Zealand, Australians, Americans as well others, many of them were fed into RAF units. And there doesn't appear to have been a great um, uproar over that. Uh, it was sort of understood. And by the end of the war, about half the Canadians served in RCAF and half served in RAF. And I think it's a reminder, uh, again, of the close ties between Canada and Britain during the Second World War, through that war, even though that war also pushes Canada into a very different trajectory uh, really becoming a North American nation through trade and commerce. But there were many millions of Canadians who had very strong links to Britain up until about the 1960s, uh, scholars tell us. And then a kind of stronger Canadian identity began to emerge as, as that older generation passed on. So it's a great question, complex one. Um, but, but Canadians, I guess the key question is, it, the Second World War was very much seen as Canada's war. If I could just interject just briefly is that um, there was a generation that grew up in the 20s and 30s where aircraft was this green promise, the technology, and Canadians had great success in the air in the First World War. So didn't want to serve in the infantry. And if you didn't, you know, the Navy was sort of an unsung service, and especially in the early part, it was you could make an impact, you could fight as an individual in the air service. And as uh, uh, Tim alluded to, there's not a lot of RCAF opportunities. So if you are of that bent, you have that technology, the type of kids that today would get into computers were getting into uh, air aircraft and that the allure of flying and being able to have an impact as an individual was all very attractive. And if the only way you could do is with the British, well, that's the way you're going to do it. Perfect. Thanks very much indeed, gents. Um, there are more questions, but frankly, it's now 20 to 10 UK time. Um, so I think we're going to call that a day. We've, we've had a really good exploration of a number of themes on, on, on the questions. And it's been a, I mean, not the, the talks themselves were absolutely first rate, but I've really enjoyed the Q&As as well. and hope everybody else watching it has enjoyed the, the questions. Um, a final round of applause, please, from everybody who, who's uh, still uh, watching this. Uh, and uh, uh, Tim and uh, Bill, his hands going up left, right and centre as, as a virtual um, thank you. So uh, 
from me, thanks very much, Tim and Bill, for your uh, efforts tonight, uh, or in your case, this afternoon, and uh, truly appreciate um, putting, your putting the time in. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you also for watching. It's been a pleasure once again to bring this to a, a wide public, and um, please do come and join us um, at the Western Front Association for more of these webinars in coming weeks and months. But from me and from Tim and Bill, that's it for tonight. Thanks Thank, very you. Much. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good night. Take care.